Today's feature presentation is entitled Screening, Diagnosis, and Treatment of TB in Immigrant and Other Vulnerable Populations, Update 2001 by Dr. Ed Zerowesty. An application for CME credit has been filed with the American Academy of Family Physicians. Determination of credit is pending. This educational activity is pending designation for a maximum of one prescribed credit by the American Academy of Family Physicians. Physicians should only claim credit commensurate with the extent of their participation in the activity. The purpose of today's webinar <clears throat> is to give an overall update of diagnosis and treatment of both active and latent tuberculosis, with emphasis on foreign-born individuals and other high-risk populations in the U.S. The participants will be presented with strategies to assist in the appropriate screening of high-risk patients and methods to assure completion of treatment for both active and latent tuberculosis. Dr. Zero Westy is the Chief Medical Officer of the Migrant Clinicians Network Incorporated, a national clinical network of providers who care for the mobile poor. Additionally, he is an Assistant Professor of Medicine at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine where he directs an international health elective for fourth year medical students to Honduras twice a year. He is the attending physician for three PA state health department TB clinics, and he serves as a clinical consultant for the Bureau of Primary Health Care throughout the country. Today's presentation will be divided into three sections, with a brief intermission for questions from the audience at the end of each section. There will be an extended question and answer session at the end of the presentation. To view today's presentation, simply log on to www.primarycareforall.org and follow the training link. Participants can then click on the desired webinar and log into the presentation session as a guest. You must have speaker capabilities in order to hear the pre presentation while viewing online. Questions can be submitted to the presenter throughout the presentation. To submit a question to the presenter, please type your question in the box provided and click the Submit button. Let's welcome Dr. Zero Westy. Well, thank you very much, Sabrina, and it's great to be uh, asked again to uh, talk about tuberculosis through the Primary Care for All web series. And as uh, Sabrina mentioned, uh, the topic, uh, the title of this uh, session is going to be Screening, Diagnosis, and Treatment of TB in Immigrant and Other Vulnerable Populations. And she already went over the CME with you, and I need to read this disclosure statement. Uh, in accordance with the American Academy of Family Physicians, guidelines requires instructors, planners, managers, and other individuals who are in a position to control the content of this activity to disclose any real or apparent conflict of interest they may have as related to the content of this activity. All identified conflicts of interest are thoroughly vetted for fair balance scientific objectivity of studies mentioned in the materials or used as the basis for content and the appropriateness of patient care recommendations. There you have it. So the objectives, and uh, Sabrina mentioned these, uh, the objectives are that the participant will know the current treatment of active and latent TB. The participant will have a better understanding of what high-risk populations should be screened for latent TB. Uh, the participant will understand why knowledge of the global impact of tuberculosis is important in their own patient population. We'll spend some time on that. And the participant will understand the importance of new screening tools and treatment regimens for TB. And finally, the participant will appreciate the ongoing health disparities in relation to tuberculosis infection and disease in the U.S. Uh, this is just uh, the topics that we're going to cover. We're going to have an introduction, then I'm going to go over uh, how TB is transmitted and what's the pathogenesis of TB, just to give everybody a little update and refresher course on TB. Then how do you diagnose TB? How do you treat both latent TB and TB disease? Then we're going to spend some time on global TB because it's important to know global TB if you're going to be treating uh, recent immigrants here in the United States. We'll go over the epidemiology of TB in the U.S. now in 2011 and then spend just a little time at the end talking about some exciting future tools uh, for both TB diagnosis and treatment. Uh, just a little introduction. I think it's important to know the audience to know that I am not an infectious disease specialist. I'm not a pulmonologist. I am a family physician. 
Uh, but my interest in tuberculosis started oh, probably 30 years ago when I first went into practice and I started taking care of migrant farm workers and found that tuberculosis was a very um, common problem with migrant farm workers. And in my small rural town, we didn't have a pulmonologist nor infectious disease. So I, like we all have to do, we're in situations like that, I had to figure out what to do with these patients that were showing up with possibility of having TB. And so I started asking a lot of questions. And what I've found in life is when you ask a lot of questions, they put you on a committee. And then when you ask questions on the committee, they make you the chair of the committee. And then as chair of the committee, you end up going to meetings uh, with a bunch of other people. And so through that um, and through the Migrant Clinicians Network, uh, we became um, founding members of the National Coalition to Eliminate Tuberculosis. And uh, in 2005, I was elected chair of the National Coalition to Eliminate TB, which is now Stop TB USA. And so through that position, I literally have been able to, to um, be a sponge around the world experts on tuberculosis. And so what I'm going to share with you today are those lessons learned that I have from uh, working with uh, these experts in tuberculosis. I continue to see TB patients uh, every week in three clinics that I run in, in um, uh, Pennsylvania. And so I'll give you some of those stories as we go along here. So that's my background. Um, you know, so, so, Sir William Osler uh, from Hopkins uh, said in 1904 that tuberculosis is a social problem with a medical aspect. And I think that's one of the reasons it, it drew me uh, to it. Uh, because TB really uh, tells us where we are socioeconomically, uh, depending on the rate of TB that we have in our community. Just want to go over just a little bit of history of TB because it's very interesting. Uh, during the 17th and 18th century, TB actually took one in every adult life on the globe. Um, just between those 200 years, 1700 to 1900, one billion human beings died of tuberculosis on the, in the world. And it wasn't, as we all know, until 1882 that Robert Koch actually discovered the cause of TB, which is the TB bacillus. And that year alone, there were 7 million people who died. But even though Robert Koch discovered in 1882, we had no treatment for TB until 1945, other than sanatoriums that were set up all over the country for treatment, which were... Uh, minimally effective at best. So it wasn't until 1944 that the development of the first antibiotic streptomycin came into to being and then uh, the hallmark of TB treatment even to today isoniazide was discovered in 1952. So it's now only been about 60 years or so that we've had good treatment for tuberculosis. Well how do you get TB? How does a person get TB? And for those of you who know this I'm just going to review it very quickly. Um, we know that it's an infectious disease caused by the bacteria, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. It's transmitted through the air and water droplets. So it's an airborne only, airborne type of infection. It primarily affects the lungs. 85% of the time it is pulmonary TB. 15% of the time it's extra pulmonary and really can affect any organ in the body. I've seen it almost everywhere. <clears throat> So how is TB spread? It's spread when a person who is sick with the TB disease and has it pulmonary wise, coughs, sneezes, uh, and releases the germ. So someone who has TB coughs like this guy in the picture. And he, when they cough, millions of bacteria float in the air. All you have to be doing is sharing that airspace with that individual. You inhale that bacteria into your lungs. Then your body actually fights it off. So usually you don't get sick initially. But this is a very smart, strong bacteria that the body does not have the capability of killing all the bacteria. Some of the bacteria surrounds itself in a protective coating, goes dormant in your lungs, and can stay dormant for 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. A person then has about a 10% uh, risk in their lifetime of reactivating that TB, but has a 90% chance that that TB will stay dormant their entire life. Untreated, if a person has active TB, they can affect about 10 to 15 other people on average a year. <clears throat> so what's the probability that you, if you're exposed to somebody with active TB, that you will get the TB? Well, it really has a lot to do with the infectiousness of the person. How many bacteria is that person actually expelling into the air when they cough? It's the environment that you're in. If you're in a closed room like I'm in right now, you're much more likely to get TB as opposed to being out in the field like this young woman here where the TB bacillus will be dispersed very quickly on the wind. 
It's the duration of exposure. How long are you around this person that has TB? And just to give you a little framework, if you're on an airplane with a patient that has active TB and you're on that airplane for less than eight hours, the CDC does not recommend that you test all the people in that plane. Another kind of uh, reference point is if uh, we've done studies on Peace Corps workers, someone who's in the Peace Corps and in a very high endemic a country. If they're there for less than three months, there's not a large number of, of conversions. But after three months, there's a larger number of conversions to, to uh, their skin tests to uh, show that they've been infected by TB. And then it's the virulence of the organism. How strong of an organism is it that is being expelled into the air? Put all this together, and that's your probability that TB will be transmitted. I've been doing TB work for like 30 years now. I've worked in, in TB clinics and all, all over the world, literally, and I'm still PPB negative. Of course, I do have this protective mask that I wear all the time. Um, so as I mentioned, if you are infected, this is where it's really strange. TB, there's a big difference between TB infection and TB disease. Once you're infected, only 10% of individuals with normal immune systems actually will develop the disease tuberculosis. 90% of infected individuals never develop disease. And that's 10% sometime in their lifetime. About half of that, about 5%, is within the first two to three years after being infected. However, it is different in children. If children under two are much more susceptible, a child under two, once they're infected, about 40% of the time, they will go on to active disease in the next two years. And unfortunately, oftentimes, those children will go into active disease and present as TB meningitis, which is very, very dangerous and can be deadly within just a few days, if not diagnosed and treated appropriately. HIV still has the strongest risk factor for developing TB if infected. If you're an untreated HIV patient, your risk of developing TB disease after being infected is not 10% in your lifetime, but is actually 7 to 10% per year uh, after being infected. And then there are certain other medical conditions that increase your risk of TB infection. Uh, progressing to TB disease, and we're doing a lot of studies now on diabetes. Diabetes seems to be one of those disease processes that seems to have a high affinity of going on to TB disease if you're infected. And so for those of us who treat a lot of foreign-born, uh, especially from Central America, and we're seeing a lot more tuberculosis, I mean a lot more diabetes now, that if you have somebody who's an uh, LTBI patient and diabetes, then you need to be much more attuned to, to the risk that they are going to, to convert to active disease. Here's a list of some of the other conditions that will increase your risk of progression of TB disease. Uh, as I mentioned, HIV infection, any sort of recent infection, that anything that drops your immune system. If you have a chest x-ray suggesting that you had previous TB in the past, diabetes, as I mentioned, any prolonged corticosteroid therapy or anyone who's on immunosuppressive therapy like chemotherapy for cancer, and if you have a history of being inadequately treated from TB, all those make you at more risk for progressing to disease if you've been infected. Common sites, I mentioned 85% of the time it's in the lungs, but it can be anywhere. It can be in the central nervous system, lymphatic system. The lymphatic system can take it anywhere. I've seen it in the kidneys, bladder, bones, uh, joints. I had a lady that, that, that she had a sinus coming out of her elbow, and it can be disseminated, miliary TB, especially in, in uh, HIV patients that have very low CD4 counts. Well, how do you diagnose TB? What, what's the current uh, form of diagnosis of tuberculosis? Well, first of all, you take a medical history, and I think it's very important to always spend time taking medical history. Oftentimes, you know, as, as we've learned a lot in, in family medicine, uh, history alone, uh, by the end of the history, you should have 80, 85 percent of your diagnosis already made. Then your physical examination can be helpful. Currently, uh, the standards are still the MANTU skin test. The MANTU skin test, however, is now 105 years old. MANTU discovered this in 1905. It has not been improved upon in those 105 years. So it's a very, very old test, a very inadequate test, a very inaccurate test with about 20% false positive rate. So the newest kids on the block are Quantiferon Gold, T-spot and L-spot, and these are all IGRAs, which are interferon gamma release assays. They're an enzyme-linked immunospot assay, and they are much, much more reliable than the PPD. Um, 
if you look at the current, they've been out for a few years now. The most current guideline from the CDC uh, now state that quantiferon gold or either of these IGRAs are actually preferable uh, diagnostic test for anyone who has had the BCG immunization, who have been uh, immunized with BCG or from a high-risk country in the world. It's really preferred over the Mantu skin test. Otherwise, Mantu skin test and quantiferin gold are equivalent according to the CDC. Then we, uh, we use chest x-rays to evaluate TB and then of course the sputum smear culture and drug sensitivities. Well, let's talk about history and physical. I, I put these two pictures up because the one on your left there, uh, I've got a little arrow here. Um, the question here is how long has this ulcer been there? And this is actually a case from Honduras. And it's important to know this guy's had this ulcer for 30 years. It was from an electrical burn that he had got 30 years ago. And so that really helps you decide what you're going to do with this case. And in the other uh, case here, this is a congenital abnormality this woman has. Um, so taking the history alone will really help you. Um, and let me tell you a little bit, a little story about history. The history has to be a culturally competent, linguistically appropriate history. I had a case just recently, in the last couple months, in in um, Pennsylvania, where a gentleman from Guatemala had just moved to our town about a week before, was working in the kitchen of a restaurant, a Mexican restaurant, had been ill for a month, but finally got so ill that he had a friend, quote unquote, a new friend took him into the uh, local emergency room. In the emergency room, uh, they used the friend, quote unquote, as their interpreter instead of getting a professional interpreter. And when they're taking the history, they ask, had this person been exposed to tuberculosis? And he didn't want his friend uh, to know that he had been around someone with TB, so he said no. And so all the questions were answered no after that. This gentleman came in with a chief complaint of chest pain, had white out on one side of his lung. They had just had a couple cases of MRSA pneumonia with big effusions. So after a very quick and inadequate history, the ER doctor felt that this was probably a MRSA uh, pneumonia with a big effusion, and they admitted him to the ICU. Uh, they took him to the OR because he was in significant respiratory distress because of this big effusion and they put a chest tube in, drained it. Uh, fortunately at the time they did a, this was an open, um, uh, they did an open biopsy of his pleura. They treated him with um, rocephin and a couple other antibiotics, IV antibiotics. He was out of the ICU within a couple days and discharged in about four days. And after he was discharged they found that the biopsy came back with granulomatous uh, disease in the pleura. At that point in time, they called us, and so on the phone, over the phone in Spanish, when I was talking to this gentleman, this is the history I got in the first three minutes. I asked him uh, how he was doing, and he said he was very afraid, and he was hoping that he wouldn't die of tuberculosis. And I asked him why he was worried about tuberculosis. And he said, because my brother is now being treated for tuberculosis in Maryland, and I have been living with him for the last year. And my grandfather just died of TB uh, in Guatemala last year. And my sister is being treated for tuberculosis in Guatemala right now. I asked him what his symptoms have been. He'd lost 20 pounds. He had been coughing for a month, coughing up virulent sputum, had called off, coughed up blood a couple times. He uh, was having fevers, night sweats, and fatigue. I didn't need a PPD. I didn't need a chest x-ray. This man had tuberculosis. But unfortunately, that history wasn't taken in the ER. So I bring this story up to just point out that history alone can tell you a lot uh, before you go on to other diagnostic tools. So the symptoms of pulmonary TB are productive cough, fever, chills, night sweats, weight loss, chest pain, hemoptysis, loss of appetite, and fatigability. And I, I hear these symptoms a lot, especially if somebody has had TB uh, for a, a few weeks, which oftentimes is the case by the time you find them. Medical history, you want to find out if the person had systems. You want to have a history of TB exposure, just like this gentleman gave an incredible history of TB exposure. Uh, past TB treatment, you want to make sure that the person in front of you hadn't been treated, maybe partially treated for TB in the past. Where do they come from? What's their demographic? Are they coming from a high-risk country where TB is, is very prevalent? What other medical conditions uh, does the person have? Are they HIV positive? They have diabetes? All these are important to find out in your history. And again, this is a quick history. In a couple of minutes, you can find all this out. 
then we use the chest x-ray. If we have someone that has a positive PPD, somebody has a positive IGRA, then we get a chest x-ray. The chest x-ray cannot be used as a diagnosis, diagnostic tool. It can just be part of your armamentarium to help you diagnose TB. The abnormalities are often seen in the apical or the posterior segments of the upper lobes or the superior segments of the upper of the lower lobes. So you can see them up and low. And oftentimes you'll see them in two or three different um, areas of the lung. You can have very unusual, however, appearance in HIV positive patients, and they can present with miliary TB oftentimes. Um, <clears throat> but the chest x-ray can be very helpful. And we use that in the United States, but in the world, uh, chest x-rays are not used very frequently. Uh, in most countries to make the diagnosis. Then you want to obtain a specimen, uh, a sputum specimen. It's best, we've always said three morning specimens are best. Sometimes that's been a barrier. So now we say we need three specimens. You can get one as soon as you see, one early morning one, then one in the clinic when you see the patient, and then one uh, the next morning. So within 24 hours, you can actually obtain these three specimens now. If the person's unable to cough up a decent sputum, then you can induce sputum or you can do bronchoscopy or in children oftentimes we do a gastric aspirin. I just had just last week a new uh, a six month old who was infected by her father and we made that diagnosis. She actually had infiltrates, did not present fortunately with TB meningitis, was actually coughing and we were able to get positive uh, acid fast bacillus from a gastric aspirate on this six month old. And obviously you're going to follow infectious control precautions when you're doing this uh, specimen collection because you're going to ask somebody to cough up a lot of the red snappers. And then you want to look at the smear. You look for acid fast bacillus on a smear. Uh, and you can get these results usually within 24 hours in most labs. And if you get acid fast bacillus, then you can make the presumptive diagnosis of TB. Although we know that there are many, many, many cousins, many mycobacterium that will look as acid fast bacillus and could mimic a tuberculosis. So it's not an absolute diagnosis. The, uh, this is what it looks like. This is what the red snappers look like on an AFB smear. Uh, they're red uh, tubic tubicular uh, bacilli. And then in the United States and um, uh, many other uh, industrialized countries, we use cultures to confirm the diagnosis. We culture all specimens, even if the person is smear negative, at least about 15% of the time. Smear negative people will actually be culture positive. We can get these results now back in four to 14 days when we use a liquid medium, but a lot of labs are still using the old solid medium, which can take up to two months to actually grow this bacteria out. It's a very slow growing bacteria. Uh, and that's always been one of the barriers to making the diagnosis. Now, the newest test that we have is the nucleic acid amplification test, NAA, which is a direct identification of MTB uh, on the clinical sp uh, specimen. So you actually have the sputum right there. You test the sputum itself. It's now becoming a standard of practice. And actually, in the 2009 MMWR, uh, stated that at least one respiratory specimen from each patient with the, who presents with signs and symptoms of pulmonary TB, TB should be sent for a, a nucleic, nucleic acid amplification. And we get these results back in 24 to 48 hours as positive or negative for MTB. Then we also do drug susceptibility testing because we want to make sure that the drugs we're using to treat TB uh, are susceptible. Um, we do that on the initial uh, culture, on the initial isolate. And then we want to repeat the, uh, the uh, susceptibility testing on any patient who doesn't respond to therapy. So if you still have a positive culture after two months of treatment, you want to retest that person and redo susceptibility testing to see if you've got a drug resistant case. Uh, and obviously you want to forward that results to your local health department if you're doing it in your hospital lab. So who are increased risk for getting drug resistance? And we're seeing this more and more all over the world. Obviously, someone who has a history of being treated with TB drugs in the past, if they come in with new active TB, they're at high risk for drug resistance. If they've been exposed to somebody who is a known drug-resistant case, they're much more likely to be resistant. Any foreign-born person who's coming from a high-prevalence uh, drug-resistant area, um, 
as I mentioned before, if you have smearing cultures that are positive despite two months of treatment, those people have a much higher risk of drug resistance. And then anybody who received inadequate treatment a regimen for TB for more than two weeks are more susceptible to having drug resistance. We're now doing a lot more genotyping. This is DNA fingerprinting. Um, and this is really most state labs now are sending uh, all their specimens, all their active case TBs uh, to find uh, the true DNA fingerprinting. This really helps us locally um, to see isolates so that we can uh, find out if these localized cases of disease are the same or different strains. It really helps us too with contamination. I've had cases where boy, somebody comes back with a positive culture and clinically they don't seem like they're positive. And then we find that in the lab, they're the exact same uh, DNA fingerprint as some other active case, and it was just cross-contamination of those, those cultures. Um, and so it really helps us with, with that sort of investigation. And then globally, it really helps us with finding strains that are causing disease in one geographic area and how it's moving across the world. Um, and it really helps us tracking now with drug-resistant strains and where they're going. Well, I'm going to stop now. Uh, we'll take a little break here to see if there are any questions out there. I went over a lot of material here. So if you have any questions, just type it in, and we'll answer those questions right now. I'll just spend a minute here to see if there's any questions before we go on to the treatment portion. So if you have a question, just type it in the little box there, and um, I'll answer them. So far, Sabrina, I don't see any in my uh, question box. Do you have anything? Yes, we do have a question. And the okay. question is, how expensive are the newer tests, and are they widely available? Yeah, the nucleic acid test is expensive. It's, it's a couple hundred dollars at least. Some labs, I think it's even more than that. Uh, they are widely available at the state health labs. Almost, I think all states now have that available to you. Most, even rural areas, have access to send specimens to their state health department. So what you'd have to do is just find out the nucleic acid uh, amplification test, just ask your county health department or your state health department if it is available and how expensive it is. It's expensive except it should be covered by your state health department so that that expense is usually not absorbed by the patient or the health center, it's absorb, absorbed by your state department of health. For example, in Pennsylvania, my patients do not have to pay for that test. My community health centers do not have to pay for that test. The state health department pays for that test. We just have to obtain the sputum, send it to the state lab. Other questions? Yes, we have another question. So when would you recommend obtaining a chest x-ray if it's not necessary for diagnosis? Yeah, it depends on whether I'm in Honduras or I'm in the States. In the States, we obtain a chest x-ray on every suspected case of TB. We also obtain a chest x-ray on every positive PPD and every positive IGRA. Anybody that has a positive test for TB infection need to have a chest x-ray because we we know they're infected but now we need to know whether they have active disease so we have to get a chest x-ray to rule out early active disease even if somebody is asymptomatic we need a chest x-ray i've seen cases where the person's totally asymptomatic they have a positive skin test or a positive igra we get a chest x-ray they have a little tiny infiltrate up in their lung they're not symptomatic yet but they have active tb so we need to treat them with four drugs not just the one drug we don't want to start them on the um, just plain INH or rifampin because then we could build up a drug resistance and we're not going to cure them with just one drug. Any other questions? Yes, there is another. We have an attendee who says, I'm sorry I missed the first part of your presentation. Are you suggesting we do sputum culture on all suspected cases and can I access the slides that I missed? So, Laura Clark, yes, you can access the slides you missed. They'll be archived. And um, 
We do sputum cultures on all suspected cases, not all infections. You can have a positive PPD, negative chest x-ray, we don't need sputum. If you have a positive PPD, you're symptomatic, you're coughing, or you have an abnormal chest x-ray, then we obtain sputum smears. Okay, should we move on? Yes, that was the last question. Okay, we'll move on, and then we'll have we'll stop again in a, uh, several more slides, and then we'll have a lot, we should have plenty of time at the end to answer any other questions. So, how do we treat latent TB? Now, again, this is somebody who's been infected by the TB bacillus, but do not have active disease. Okay, uh, you've done a PPD, you've done a IGRA, a quantiferon gold, or a um, T spot, and you found the person's been infected. You did a chest X-ray. They have a normal chest x-ray, so now they have latent TB infection, and you don't want them to have that 10% chance in their lifetime. You don't want them to go into active disease. So you can treat them, and the treatment of choice right now still is isoniazide, nine months, a terribly long time, daily. So that's 270 pills you have to take. A secondary OK regimen is six months of INH daily. And the difference between those two, it used, to be, it used to be a year. Then we went to six months. It's about 70% effective at six months. It's about 90% effective at nine months. So we try to get nine months in, which means if you take nine months, your risk is not 10% in your lifetime, but it's less than 1% that you're going to reactivate your TB. Another secondary regimen is rifampin daily for four months. And the, this is the new kid on the block, and you wouldn't have seen anything about this yet because it hasn't been published. I was fortunate to be asked to go to the CDC a couple weeks ago to help write the guidelines on this new regimen. It should be published. The study has not been published yet. It should be published in the New England Journal of Medicine probably within the next month or two. But it's a new regimen of INH and rifapentine, which is a cousin of rifampin. And that is just taking 900 milligrams of INH, 900 milligrams of rifapentine once a week for 12 weeks. So instead of taking 270 doses of INH, you're taking 12 doses. And this could revolutionize, really, uh, LTBI treatment. So those new guidelines will be coming out, so, so pay attention. That should be happening soon. For those of us who treat a lot of mobile populations, this could really help us. Right now, it's going to be directly observed therapy, which means somebody's going to have to go out and give this to the patient once a week. But even at that, we think it's going to be cost effective. <clears throat> so that's treatment of latent TB. Now how about active tuberculosis? So you put a skin test on. It's positive. The person's symptomatic. You get a chest x-ray. It's abnormal. You have them cough up sputum. They have a positive smear or their uh, nucleic acid uh, amplification test is positive, or you presumptively think they have active TB. So you want to give them treatment for active TB. And sometimes I start this treatment before I have a definitive diagnosis, because that can wait. It can take a couple weeks to get that definitive diagnosis, and you don't want this person infecting other people. So you want to provide the safest, most effective treatment in the shortest time. You have to use multiple drugs to which the organisms are susceptible. You never add a single drug to a failing regimen, and you have to assure adherence to therapy. <clears throat> adherence uh, has been a huge problem all over the world because you have to take, sometimes you're taking 12 to 16 pills a day in the first eight weeks, and this treatment takes six months. So obviously people start feeling better and they don't take the pills correctly. So non-adherence was a huge problem. So now, all over the world, the treatment of care, the, the standard of care, is to use directly observed therapy, DOT, to ensure patients complete treatment. This is the only infectious disease where we literally are sending caseworkers out on a daily basis to actually give the pills to the patient and watch them, watch them swallow the pills. So in Pennsylvania, no matter who you are, I had a pulmonologist I was treating. Someone literally went to his office every day, gave him the pills, watched him swallow the pills. That's directly observed therapy. And that is to assure adherence to this complicated regimen. So as I mentioned, the healthcare worker actually watches the patient swallow. It's not that they go there, give them the pills, and then leave. They actually have to watch the person swallow the pills. We now do it for all patients, 
it has led to reductions in relapse and it's really helped with drug resistance keeping drug resistance down because all drug resistance is iatrogenic it's because somebody gave the person a treatment regimen that the person didn't adhere to did not take it completely killed off the susceptible bugs and let the resistant bugs then grow so here's how we treat uh, all TB cases that are HIV negative and this is globally I treat we treat them exactly the same in Honduras India Africa as this regimen as in the United States so for the first eight weeks eight weeks we use isoniazide rifampin pyrazinamide and ethambutol you can substitute streptomycin for ethambutol but streptomycin is an injectable so people don't usually like that so much so we usually use the INH rifampin pyrazinamide and ethambutol then we adjust the regimen when we get the drug susceptibilities if, if they're pan sensitive then we keep them on that and we treat them for eight weeks not two months eight weeks and we actually do pill counts now that would be the equivalent of eight weeks then after eight weeks we'll get rid of the pyrazinamide and ethambutol and that's usually three or four pills of each one of those so that's usually getting rid of six to eight pills and then we're left with uh, rif rifampin and, and isoniazide in the United States that's a combo pill called rifamate so it's actually two pills and then we also give a vitamin vitamin B6 to prevent one of the side effects of, of isoniazide um, so they're actually taking just two pills and um, and a vitamin and then you use that in the continuation phase for 18 weeks so it's a total of 26 weeks which is uh, six months so it's a long regimen I mean think about all the in other infections meningitis urinary tract infections pneumonia you know most treatments are a week two weeks even osteomyelitis you know a month two months this is a six month treatment for infectious disease this is one of the reasons why it's very very difficult to treat TB all over the world Extra pulmonary TB, in most cases, we treat them the same as pulmonary TB. If you have in your bone or joints or miliary TB, then we bump it up to nine months. TB meningitis in children or TB meningitis in adults, we do it for a minimum of 12 months. In pregnant women, we use nine months regimen of INH, rifampin, and ethambutol because PZA and streptomycin are contraindicated in women. Then I always, you know, these are CDC slides. This one always drives me crazy, but PZA is not contraindicated in HIV positive pregnant women. Uh, I've never really gotten an answer to that, except that it's much more important to use it, uh, PZA, because you can't use rifampin. Um, uh, you have to use rifabutin in, in pregnant women uh, who are HIV positive. So PZA you can use. In children, most cases, we treat the children with the same regimen as the adults. That six-month-old I told you about, I'm treating them. That six-month-old has taken INH, rifampin, ethambutol, and PZA every day, which works out to about 28 cc's of liquid for that little kid. And I've actually had to divide it up because that baby started vomiting uh, with that regimen. Um, and infants, as I mentioned, we treat them as soon as the diagnosis is even, even suspected because of the... A quick uh, the the rapid chance that they could go with TB meningitis and I've seen babies die within 24 to 48 hours with TB meningitis it's very dangerous and there's also been new recommendations as of 2003 to extend the course past the six months if you have a patient with cavitary lesions on their initial chest x-ray or a positive sputum culture after two months of treatment we extend them for nine months and the reason for that recommendation was that up until 2003 we only treated that person for six months and what we found was a 21 percent relapse rate 21 percent of the time those people were coming back uh, reactivating their TB and that happened to me once I had a patient six months we treated her dotted her we knew she took all the medicines within six months she came back with active disease again fortunately she was still pan sensitive it was the same fingerprint we just didn't wipe it out the first time She'd had cavitary lesions. She was still positive at two months. Put her back on for nine months and cured her. If you have one of those two, you have a cavitation on the first chest x-ray or you have positive culture after two months, then your relapse rate is five to six percent. So you may want to consider, even if you have one of those, to bump it up to nine months. Your relapse rate usually is two percent or less uh, if you have neither of those factors.
Let's talk a minute about multiple drug resistant TB. These are very difficult treatment problems. They have to be modified um, uh, patient by patient, they have to be individualized, and it's at least two years of treatment. Look at that. 18 months to two years. Sometimes we've gotten away with 18 months. The last few that I've treated, it's been two years. Not just six months, two years. Think about what that's like with a more complicated regimen than what I just described to you. So any clinicians who are unfamiliar with treatment of MDRTB should seek expert consultation. Every MDR case I have, I talk to the National TB Center in New Jersey and work with their staff to decide a treatment regimen. I will go ahead and treat them, but only with consultation uh, with world experts. We always use directly observed therapy, obviously, for those people. And directly, uh, excuse me, multiple drug resistant TB, um, let me just back up here. That is when MDR TB is, is um, when you are resistant to both INH and rifampin. Both INH and rifampin, uh, the two strongest drugs for TB, then you're classified as multiple drug resistant TB. You could be resistant to INH, PZA, and ethambutol. That's not considered MDR TB. You have to have at least INH and rifampin. And you have to monitor the, the uh, response to treatment. So what we do is check um, monthly. We check sputums to make sure that they've converted uh, cultures to negative. After three months of treatment, if the cultures are still positive or the symptoms have not resolved, then we want to do a, a reevaluation to make sure they're not drug resistant, make sure they actually are taking the, the drugs as we prescribe them. Uh, and if they have not converted to negative despite three months of therapy and you haven't been directly observed therapy, doing directly observed therapy, obviously you should do it at that point in time. Well, how about BCG? And this is important for all of you who are treating or seeing as patients people who are born outside the United States. Most developing countries still immunize all their children with BCG. Um, that's the vaccine, the only vaccination we have now for tuberculosis. It's usually done the day after the child is born on the first day of life, second day of life, and then sometimes they're given boosters depending on the country. Um, BCG uh, looks kind of like the old smallpox vaccination. You'll see a scar on the person's arm if they've had a BCG vaccination. Uh, it's not recommended for immunization programs in the United States. We don't use BCG in the United States nor uh, in the industrialized countries in Europe. Uh, but it's highly used all over the rest of the world. And just so you know, BCG is not a great vaccination except for infants. The reason we're doing it all over the world is because many children were dying from TB meningitis as infants. They were infected um, uh, in their uterine or immediately after being born and they would die of TB meningitis. If you give a BCG, it prevents TB meningitis in infants. It does not prevent TB infection of infants. It does not prevent those children to go on later to get um, uh, active disease. It just prevents TB meningitis. And that's important to know. Uh, now we're going to talk about the burden of global TB. I'm going to stop here because I've given you a lot of information again. And so we're going to stop for some questions right here. So Sabrina. Yes, I have a question. OK. So can you do subsequent tests for re-exposure on a person who's been successfully treated and cured? And that's a very good question, Sabrina. And that's, unfortunately, both the TB skin test and quantiferin gold, the blood test, once you're positive, you're always positive. Because that's your immune system saying, we've been infected by this protein. And um, so you're going to have a lifetime of positivity. That's why if you put a PPD on somebody and it's positive, don't put another one on. It's always going to be positive. It's going to get bigger and bigger. I've seen it turn to really vesicular kind of lesions, get huge. So never put another TB skin test on if you've already got a positive. There are some studies ongoing now with the newer blood test, the quantiferon gold, because that gives you a number. It gives you a quantitative number. And there's some research going on now. What is that number? mean. Um, you're going to get back, the test will say positive or negative. 
but that positive and negative has a number to it. And some people feel that the higher the number, the more recent infection, and then after you've treated somebody for LTBI or active disease, that number may go down to a significant other number. That research is ongoing now. So I'm, we may be able to tell you in the future that um, you can do a subsequent test. Right now, if somebody's re-exposed, they should. Their body has an immune system now. So if I've been treated for active TB and now I'm going to get exposed to another active case, my body should fight that off because I, I have the antibodies now already in my body and kill it all off so I don't get uh, reinfected and I don't get active disease again. But I can't. I've had patients that have gotten a new strain of TB and gotten new active disease again. But right now there's no way for us to test to see if somebody's been re-exposed. Do you have any other questions? Well, how did you know that, oh, I would assume that that person would have been treated and cured by sputum. And so um, they would have been able to say to you, if you didn't know this patient personally, that yes, I was treated before, or you had records to prove that they were actually cured, and this wasn't a resistant case that just um, flared up again. All right, and the only way to know that for sure is through that DNA fingerprinting. So if I have somebody in front of me who had been treated before, had active disease, if I have access to their DNA fingerprinting the first time, and now I have another strain, then I could say, hey, you've reactivated. We didn't cure you. You might have thought we thought you were cured, but you have been reinfected by the same strain that infected you the first time. If the DNA fingerprint is different, then they've gotten exposed to somebody else. But we don't have a long enough history to, to usually know what the DNA printing was on that first case. But in the future, we'll be able to tell, tell you that. Other questions? Shall we move on? Yes, let's move on. OK. So let's talk about global TB, because this is important, because those of you who are out in health centers treating people who are recently uh, immigrated to this country, from high burden countries. It's important for you to know what life was like where they came from. So why do we need to know, why do we care about TB in the rest of the world? Because in the world it's huge. There's an estimated 9.4 million cases of active TB every year. About 86% of those, or almost 8 million, are in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. 15% of the new cases now are also HIV infected. So they're now 1.37 million new cases a year who are co-infected with TB and HIV. 79% of these HIV cases are in the African region and 11% are in Southeast Asia. So 90% of these co-infected patients right now are in those two regions. Another way to look at this is for all the TB cases now that are coming into Africa, so you're seeing somebody in your office in Africa and they have active TB. 38% of them are, are known or undiagnosed HIV infected also. So 38% are co-infected TB and HIV. Two million people died of TB in 2008, and 98% of those deaths were in the developing world. In the 2009 Global TB Control Report, which is the most recent one that we have, it revealed that one out of every four TB deaths are HIV related twice as many as we thought before. So that literally 456 deaths were among HIV positive incident TB cases, which equated to 33% of the HIV positive cases of TB. I know that's a little confusing, but that means one in every three cases that came in co-infected ended up dying that year. Uh, and overall, it was 23% of all the estimated 2 million cases were also co-infected. So you hear someone dies of HIV. They're actually dying of tuberculosis. I, I use, use this bottom statistic a lot when I have a patient. Let's say I have a local uh, Pennsylvania person who comes in with active TB, I mean uh, positive skin test, and they've been infected by TB. They, TB. They're just horrified. Oh my God, how could I have gotten this? You know, I went on this trip, went on a mission trip or something, and now I'm infected. Oh my gosh, it's horrible. And I tell them that they just joined a big club that on the globe, there are a little over 6 billion human beings now in the, in the world. And one-third, uh, literally 2 billion people have been infected with TB bacillus. So one in every three human beings on the globe has a positive skin test or a positive IGRA. 
TB, uh, TB causes more deaths among women worldwide than all causes of maternal mortality. Every year, 8 million people around the world become sick with TB. Every day, 20,000 people develop TB disease and 5,000 die. On average, a person dies every 15 seconds of tuberculosis in the world. And it accounts for more than one quarter of all the preventable adult deaths in the developing countries. So globally, this is a huge problem. And so this prompted uh, last year on World TB Day for Dr. Margaret Chan, who's the Director General of the WHO, to state that these findings point to an urgent need to find, prevent, and treat TB in people living with HIV and to test for HIV in all patients with TB in order to provide prevention, treatment, and care. Countries can only do that through stronger collaboration programs and stronger health systems that address both diseases. So these diseases really go hand in hand and the WHO and the CDC have over the last several years really worked to get these out of silos and put them uh, together. Here's just a way to look at the, the 22 most high burden countries. Um, and look at China. China has 1.3, a little over 1.3 million cases a year out of that 8 or 9 million cases. 1.3 million are in China and 1.2 million are in India. So that literally 2.5 million cases a year come from those two countries alone. And if you look at this map, it's mainly Africa and uh, Southeast Asia. The only one on the, uh, in the Western Hemisphere is down here, Brazil. Brazil is the only one that is in our hemisphere. All the rest is are in Africa and Southeast Asia. Okay, now we're going to talk about global control. Uh, this this child is trying to control this uh, frog, and and sometimes I think. Uh, global TB control is like this. We barely have it under control, and at any minute it can be, turn into a real disaster. I think this is also an oral and a behavioral health problem. Um, so the current international uh, TB control strategy through the WHO, through the Stop T TB strategy, of which the U.S. has a Stop TB strategy very similar to this, is that we're going to pursue high-quality, directly observed therapy, enhancement, and expansion all over the world. We're going to address the TB HIV and the multiple drug uh, TB uh, challenges. Um, we're going to contribute to health system strengthening. You really have to have a good primary care health system to adequately treat TB. We're going to engage all care providers. That's why I'm giving this talk today. Everybody out there on the front lines need to be very TB savvy. Uh, we're going to empower people with TB. There's not been, as opposed to the HIV community, the HIV community of patients have been very proactive. The TB community of patients have not been proactive. And we're going to enable and promote new research. So here I want to talk about the emergence of the worst case scenario. Here's the worst case scenario. You're at the beach with your kid. Your kid's head falls off. I mean, that's kind of the worst case scenario when you're at the beach with your children. Um, so the worst case scenarios right now in the world are the co-infection between TB and HIV. These are two, this is a deadly combination. Then the multiple drug resistant TB. And as I mentioned, to make the diagnosis of multiple drug resistant TB, you're resistant to both INH and rifampin, the two most powerful uh, anti-TB drugs. Now the new kid on the block, the bad, bad boy, is XDRTB, extensively drug resistant TB. So this is TB that is MDR, so you're resistant to both INH and rifampin, plus you're resistant to any of the fluoroquinolones, which are the very good secondary drugs, and at least one of the second-line injectables, either amikacin, canamycin, or capriomycin. If you're resistant to those four, then you are extensively drug-resistant TB, and you have about a 50% mortality rate if you have XDRTB in the world. Right now, the global burden of TB HIV, as I mentioned, one-third of the 33 million people living with HIV AIDS now are co-infected with TB. So we know that 10 million people, over 10 million people, have co-infection right now. And without treatment, 90% of them will die within months. If you don't treat either HIV or TB, 90% of these people die within months. Um, because... Together, they spread and speed the other's progression. It's the leading cause of death among HIV-positive people. 50% of all people worth, worldwide who die of, quote-unquote, HIV are actually dying of tuberculosis.
The multiple drug resistant TB, it's estimated that there are 390,000 to 500,000 MDR cases in 2008. The best estimates are about 4,400 cases or about 3.6% of all cases are MDR. But this is uh, felt to be very underestimated because most places in the world are not doing cultures. So they don't know that they're resistant. We think that the global prevalence could be as high as a million out of those 8 million. China, India, and the Russian Federation and South Africa have the largest number of MDR cases, and there are a lot of hot spots for MDR, especially in the former Soviet Union. Then the extensively drug-resistant TB, the really bad kid, um, there's some hot spots of that also. For example, of the MDR cases in these countries, in Japan, of the MDR cases, 30% of them are, are actually XDR. Tajikistan, it's 21%. The Ukraine, it's 15% of their MDR or XDR. In the United States, I, I should have updated this. Last year, we had one more case. We've now had 57 cases of XDR-TB in the United States. And as of July of last year, 58 countries and territories had reported at least one case of XDR-TB. And a lot of that is because we feel it's probably all over the world, but places just aren't testing for it. So why, the real question really comes, why do we still have... Why does TB infect one-third of the world's population still remain a huge global threat despite the fact that we have a highly cost-effective treatment for TB and have for, for, for over 50 years? In Africa, it, it costs $15 to treat an active case of TB. $15. So those 2 million people who died of TB for $30 million, they could have all been cured. It's, it's, it, it's very cost-effective treatment. Well, it's because of the challenges of TB control. There are insufficient financial and human resources. There are inadequate health care infrastructure. There's weak laboratory capacity and lack of new diagnostic tests. Um, and there's lack of new drugs that could cure TB. I told you, you have to treat for six months. That's a terribly long time. Lack of an effective vaccine. There's vaccine for many other disease processes, but not one for TB. There's minimal social mobilization. The patients aren't out crying about TB. And there's still a huge stigma. You know, the stigma all comes from, you know, you had to be quarantined before 1945. If you had TB, they stuck you up on a mountain somewhere. They put a, a notice on your door, do not enter. And so that stigma still is throughout the world. And now with the HIV stigma on top of that, it's, it's, it's a real problem. And now we have the HIV and MDR and XDR threats. So these are all challenges to eliminating TB. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about us here in the United States. Where are we with TB in the United States? Well, it's going down. In um, 2002, we had um, 15,000 cases or a case rate of 5.2 per 100,000. But by 2009, um, we uh, had the biggest decrease between 2008 and 2009. We went from 4.2 per 100,000 to 3.8 per 100,000, which was a drop of 11.4%. Uh, and then this past year, uh, in 2010, we dropped to 3.6 per 100,000, only 11,000 cases, which is the lowest recorded since we've been recording TB uh, 1953. So we're doing a good job. It's going down There's uh, in the United States. But it's kind of hit and miss. This is a map that shows the TB rates in, in the state, so you can pick out your own state. The lowest is Maine with... Um, with a TB rate of 0.6 per 100,000. The highest is Hawaii with 8.8 .8 per 100,000. 32 states had lower rates in 2010 than they did in 2009, but 18 states actually had a higher rate. And this is important. Four states, California, Florida, New York, and Texas, each report more than 500 cases. And combined, combined those four states account for nearly half of all the TB case in the United States. So those four states account for over half of the uh, cases in the United States. So the case, as I mentioned, the TB case rate of 3.6 um, last year represented 3.9 decline and the lowest recorded. But progress has actually slowed in recent years because we've gone from an average of 7.3% per year uh, in the preceding 10 years to now a decrease of only 3.8 during the last 10 years. And we also know that groups are um, disproportionately uh, burdened by tuberculosis. Uh, Hispanics are seven times 
more likely to have active TB than non-Hispanic whites. African Americans, eight times higher, and this is the greatest disparity in TB rates among U.S. born, are the African American uh, incidence of, of TB. Asians, 25 times higher, and non-U.S. born are 11 times higher than U.S. born, and I'm going to go into that in a little more detail. This, this slide right here shows us how it has been decreasing in the United States. The dark bars, these dark bars are U.S. born cases. The lighter bars are foreign born. So you can see back in 1993, the majority of cases were in U.S. born. Uh, fewer in foreign born. But that quickly decreased till in the year 2001, 50% of all cases were U.S. born, 50% were foreign born. And now, we've noticed that U.S. born have continued to drop dramatically, but the foreign born has stayed fairly steady, so that now over 60% of all the TB cases in the United States are in the foreign born, as opposed to the U.S. born. So that now, last year, 60.5% 60, 60 of TB was in foreign born. In 2009, and this is what I want you to know out on the front lines, if you're having somebody who just came to the United States, that they immigrate within the last four years in the United States, last four years, 35% of all the active cases in the foreign born occurred within the first four years of coming into the United States. The other thing to realize is, where are they coming from? <clears throat> 50% of all the foreign-born cases are coming from four countries, Mexico, the Philippines, India, and Vietnam. And that has a lot to do with the number of immigrants coming from those countries. But it helps you decide who you're going to screen. If you see a recent immigrant, someone who's coming to the United States within the last five years from one of these countries or other high-burden countries, these are the people that you want to screen. These are the people who are at the highest risk, if they are positive with their skin test, to convert to active disease. So they would be the ones that you want to get on prophylactic medication with INH or rifampin. So the trends now of non-U.S. born, as I mentioned, this is just a trend of the percentage of overall cases was only about 25% in 1988, and now it's up to over 60%. The MDR cases also have dramatically changed. The MDR cases initially in 1993 were mainly in U.S. born, the blue bar, and very few in the white bar. Now the huge majority are foreign born MDR versus U.S. born. So the proportion of MDR cases among persons without previous history of TB has remained stable. About 1%, if you don't have a history of, of, of being treated for TB, your chance of MDR is about 1%. But it's four to five times higher if you have a previous history. So if you have somebody presents to you and said, yeah, I was treated in Guatemala, I don't know, maybe three for three or four months, 10 years ago, be concerned that, that person could have MDR. They have at least a five or 6% chance of being MDR if they're active again. And as I mentioned before, the non-US born now account for almost 85% of the MDR cases in the United States. And as I mentioned also, we've had one case of XDR in the last year. Here's just a slide showing people co-infected with HIV and TB. Fortunately, it's slowly going down both in the age group from 25 to 44. And overall, the co-infected HIV and TB is continued on a downward slope in the United States. I'm going to spend a little time here on, on migrating population because uh, this is why you're seeing what you're seeing. Immigration has played a huge role in the United States uh, since its inception. Now immigrants in the United States, U.S. residents, one in every eight U.S. residents were born outside the United States. The last census in 2009 showed that we have now in the United States a little over 300 million people, about 307 million people. Of that, 12.5%, 38 million are foreign born. And remember, 60% of the TB, therefore, is coming for 12% of our population. So that's why it's coming into this pocket now that we need to screen and treat before they have active disease. International travel is huge. 51 million international travelers to the United States in 2006. It's felt to be, it's anticipated it's going to increase by 9% in the next five years. Travelers from China has increased 24%. We expect visitors from India to increase 50% and, to, and from China to increase 64% in just a couple years by two, 2013. 
And the reverse is true. We're traveling overseas. 35 million people are traveling to, to uh, outside the United States uh, every year. So there's going to be exposure uh, in both directions. I want to spend just a minute on talking about our, my organization, the Microclinicians Network, uh, how we can help treat LTBI and active TB cases in mobile populations. We have what's called TB Net program, which we've now had since 1996. It's what we call a virtual patient navigation, bridge case management, and medical record transfer program. It began 16 years ago in 1996. We've now case managed over 4,400 patients. We have a contract, ongoing contract with uh, Homeland Security through Immigration Customs Enforcement for the last six years. We recently got a grant from the Bureau of Primary Healthcare and HRSA. Um, and I just analyzed our last uh, five years. We've, we've case managed 805 patients with active tuberculosis to 56 countries in the last five years with an almost 85% completion of therapy rate, which is equivalent to what the completion treatment is for stable population in the United States. So if you need more information of that, just go to our website, www.migrantclinician.org and under TBNet, or just let me know and I can help you with that. So here's what the international visitors of the United States have done over the last uh, decade or so, and it's going to go up. So what is the current challenges to TB control now? It's the lack of new drugs that would cure TB in a shorter time. It's a lack of effective vaccine that would prevent the spread, and it's the HIV, MDR, and XDR threats. So we got a big problem. That big problem is global TB, okay? And if we don't do anything, we keep feeding that global TB, this banana of XDR TB, MDR TB, needing to treat for six months up to two years, not having a good vaccine, not having good diagnostic tools, guess what's going to happen? What's going to happen is that big fat problem is going to come into a bigger problem. Here's a three-year-old, weighs 233 pounds. My wife's a midwife. She did this actual delivery. There's a little shoulder dystocia here, a little shoulder dystocia with this, with this delivery. So if nothing is done, this is what's going to happen. Or we could wait for this little guy to come along, baby born with angels to save us all from this. Um, or we can do something about it. Um, and so currently there is some good news. We now have a better blood test. Quantiferon Gold and Elispot, these enzyme-linked immunospot assays, we're going to get rid of the PPD. It's had a long run, 105 years. That's long enough. It's time to bury that sucker. Um, <clears throat> this is a much more accurate test. It doesn't uh, interfere with a BCG. BCG does not counteract with that, as does the PPD. So you can tell people, hey, if your quantiferin's positive, you've been infected with TB. We need a more effective TB vaccine. We're hoping that within the next t 10 years, we're going to have a new TB vaccine. We need better treatment options. And right now, as I mentioned, there is one coming up for LTBI, 12 weeks of once a week, INH and rifapentine for 12 weeks. And we need a much stronger global financial commitment to TB elimination. On the diagnostic side, there's a very exciting thing that just came out. It's in the September 9th issue of New England Journal of Medicine last year, 2010. This is called Expert MTB RIF. It's a new diagnostic test for TB. It's really a cool thing. It's an automated rapid molecular detection of TB and rifampin resistance at the same time. So here's how it works. You have the person in front of you. They cough up a big hunk of sputum. You go through two manual processes you have to do this where you liquefy the TB. You, you can train somebody about how to do this in two hours. Then you put it in the machine. Once it's in the machine, it takes an hour and 45 minutes, and then it spits out the report. And the report says you do or do not have TB, MTB, and it is or is not resistant to rifampin. Amazing. In two hours, you have, yes, you have TB, and yes, it's resistant. And most rifampin resistance are also resistant to INH, so you have MDR-TB. In two hours, you know you have active TB and it's MDR. They, they tested this on 1,700 cases. It correctly identified 98% of the smear positive and culture positive patients, 72% of the smear negative but culture positive. Nine, over 98% of the time, it was correct with the rifampin resistance. 
when checked against culture, and it was 99.2% accurate in ruling out TB. So this is a great test. It's, however, very expensive. $20,000 is what the machine cost at a cost of $63 per test, but that's coming down. They're already offering it now uh, at about a third of that to developing countries. And so Mario Raviglioni, who's the head of the World Health Organization Stop TB states that this could revolutionize TB care in the world. So my final slide is that increasing risk of TB is for all. Failure of us to develop measures to prevent and treat TB everywhere threatens our ability to, to control uh, TB disease anywhere. The elimination of TB in the United States will depend increasingly on the elimination of TB among a lot of the patients that we take care of, non-U.S. born individuals. So the TB anywhere is TB everywhere. If it's in rural Pennsylvania, it's everywhere. And I see it every month in rural Pennsylvania. So that ends my formal part of this talk. We still have some minutes left. There's my contact information. Uh, and we can open it up for other questions now. Richard. Thank you so much, Dr. Zerowski. I greatly, greatly appreciate this, this presentation. We do have a question from a Laura Clark uh, who's, who asked, um, are you suggesting that we do spectrum cultures on all suspected cases? And can I access the slides that I missed? So we can, we can definitely get you those slides. But uh, can you address our question about the culture? Yeah, and actually, actually, I answered that first one I, uh, in one of the breaks here. Uh, okay. I answered her question about that. So okay. I did, I did that during one of the breaks. And then the other sure. question is, uh, so when would you recommend obtaining a CXR if it's not necessary for diagnosis? Yeah, and that one too. Sorry. These were questions that came up in our two breaks, Richard. Okay, just double sorry. checking. Yeah. Just double yeah. checking. That's all right. That's all right. I, I think just as, a, as, as I'll ask myself a question, and that is I'm at a community health center uh, or a free clinic or wherever, and I have uh, a foreign-born person in front of me. Should I screen them for TB? Here, here's a caveat. Let me tell you what's happened to me. Uh, every year in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, 3,500 microfarmers come in. Most of them are from Mexico and Guatemala. If I screened all 3,500, 30 to 40 percent of them would have, have a positive skin test. That would put on my local health department 1,000 or 1,200 individuals that would need a chest x-ray and need to be seen in our clinics. That would overwhelm our clinics and we couldn't do it. So you have to do targeted testing. It's now recommended we do targeted testing. So that what you do, depending on your resources, is you always want to screen all children from foreign born, born in foreign born countries of high risk, high incidence. Always screen the kids because if a kid is positive, like that six month old I told you about, if that six month old is positive, somebody in that house also has active TB. If that two year old's positive, somebody's been around that kid very closely, probably a family member who has active disease. So it's going to help you find other active cases. So you want to screen all children of foreign born individuals. You want to screen all foreign-born who are recent arrivals, especially from very high-risk countries. And recent arrivals means within the first five years of coming in the country. So if you have many, many Mexican immigrants in your population who have been in this country over five years, it is not necessarily recommended to screen all of them. First, you want to screen the ones who have just newly arrived. If you have the resources, then it's fine to screen all of them because that first five years is only picking up 35% of the foreign born. There's still 65% of the foreign born who activate after being in the country over five years. Any other questions, Richard? I just want to clarify that a little bit. So I don't have any other questions on my screen. But you may have on yours. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Zerowski. Um, I don't see any further questions. Okay. So, um, again, I would like to thank you for your participation in the uh, in this webinar series.
And I do want to thank you along with the, the tech staff who helped us with this presentation. Um, again, the Primary Care for All webinar series is made possible through a partnership between the National Center for Primary Care, the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved, the National Health and Homeless Council, and the Clinical Directors Network, and the Migrants Clinicians Network. This partnership allows PrimaryCareForAll.org to serve as a resource for the National Health Service Corps members and other clinicians working in the underserved areas. Direct support for this webinar series was made possible with direct support from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Health Resources and Services Administration, and the Bureau of Clinicians Recruitment and Service. PrimaryCareForAll.org is funded under a cooperative agreement with HHS, HRSA, and BCRS. Again, please don't forget to fill out your questionnaire at the end of this uh, series. And thank